In order to plan for today's lesson, I had to think about what we had covered in the previous lessons and our pacing through the curriculum. We are at the end of chapter eight. Um, so we had discussed factoring before and I had to keep in mind my kids that have been absent, the days that I've been out on TDEs, things like that. And because of that, we actually decided to combine two lessons into one. So while we were addressing special cases, I also threw in some of 8-8, which is grouping. Um, and having that flexibility in the curriculum actually allows you to knock out two lessons at once if you can find connections from previous lessons into the current material. I also had to keep in mind what my students' strengths and weaknesses are. So when I wanted to pull them into different groups, what groups are gonna work well together, what groups really need this um, extra push, which kids can I release faster than others, and that affects the student grouping. So that doesn't really affect as much of the front half of the lesson as it does the back half of the lesson. But to even include 8-8 was a decision that we had to make in the math department that factoring is something we've already discussed in great detail. It's relevant, we want them to see it, but we don't have to spend the entire front half of the lesson discussing it. When students enter my classroom, they know the expectation is to find their seat and to take out their interactive journals. They use their journals every day. So the routine is always the same. They update their table of contents and um, they head their page the same every day. Um, the lesson title is on the board with the CBC and so is the objective and the essential question. And then while people are finishing up with that, the solve it is already there for them and they know that, hey, if I'm done updating my journal, it's time to start the solve it. And we know we're gonna go back to addressing the objective and the essential question once everybody is situated, we've looked at the solve it and we can make the connections we need to make. But every day looks very similar for the first five to 10 minutes of class. Journal updates, let's go like two or three minutes. If you finish your journal updates early, you can start your solve it on page 529 with a neighbor, okay? So let's go level one, 529, solve it. Yes, yeah. Yet? Yep, just like you always do. Make sure your table of contents is updated. I think especially with the Algebra 1 class, it's important to infuse the CBC into the lesson because these girls need to know what they're doing and why. So I never start a lesson with, here's what we're going to do today, guys. I like them to explore it when they get a chance to see the solve it, and then we make connections to the old material, and then we bring it into the new material. And I think it's very fluid, and I like to be able to reference it during the class period. Ultimate goal, guys, what are we supposed to be able to walk out of here having done? What have we accomplished today? And that works for girls that are very goal-oriented, and they like that structure. They like to know, hey, here's what we're doing, and here's why it's relevant. And for my girls that are very focused on the EOC and I'm gonna see it and I need to know it and it's applicable in real life, the CBC is super important because it allows them to make those connections. I use the solve it to start my lesson for several reasons. One is I want the children to have something to do besides updating their journal. For the kids who get their journal updated really quick, they need to have something that's aligned to today's lesson to get the brain juices flowing. Um, I do use discretion when I assign solve -its. Knowing full well that some solve are harder for children to solve than others, it's still something for them to do and it's aligned, so it really is meant as mental exercise, honestly, for the students to get in the mindset, hey, this is what I need to be able to do by the end of the day today. If I couldn't do it in the first five minutes of class, hopefully I'll be able to do it by the last five minutes of class. All right, if you finished updating your journal, you're having a level one discussion with your neighbor over page 529. Let's go five minutes from now, okay? We're gonna have a discussion about it five minutes from now. All right, so Taylor's already updated. She's working on the problem. Hannah's finishing updates. She's working on the problem. I identify students who are following instructions as they're delivered. So I positively narrate the class. So when I notice that one student has accomplished the goal or the task early, I always give them that credit and then I follow around and I positively narrate somebody else. That way any student that's not on task or isn't picking up the speed when it's time to get the journal updated or who's gonna be behind when it's time to do the solve it knows, hey, everybody else is already done, I need to play catch up. Three more minutes of accountable discussion, okay guys? Between you and your neighbor, I'm sure we can come up with something here. How do you usually find the top of your butterfly? By multiplying A, you see? Does A have a value in this case? No, so it's just 49. X is, equal is it A just X? Yes. That's fine. Correct her if you want to or talk it out. See what see what days it did. Okay, I just did that. Yeah. 
Because it's like, you see his ex. It looks like a good method. Are you prepared to defend it? Quit, like, uh, uh, like, a fantasy one right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So, like, what, what are we actually doing? So, mm -hmm. we're comparing these mm -hmm. two by yeah. simplifying that one to find the binomial. Mm -hmm. And then what? How, how is that? Because like, that's not a binomial. Okay. So, don't overthink this one. So, if the area is 25, what can you assume about a side length? It's five. Okay. Five. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, start with that. Run with that. So, if you did a side length here, you could also do a side length here which is the same thing as your binomial. Mm -hmm. So just start playing around with that. Okay. You're on the right track. Absolutely. It's a two factor. All right, let's bring it down, guys. I need everybody's eyes up here tracking the board. We're going to talk about the way that we would tackle this problem. Remember, the purpose of this problem is just to get the brain juices flowing, and we're going to tie it into what we've learned about in the previous days and what we're going to learn about today. Okay. So the first question I have is, how would you attack this problem? Talana. First, read the problem to understand what you're saying. So read the problem, break it down, figure out what it's asking. What else? Excellent. What else? No right or wrong? Yeah, Anaya. Uh, set up the butterfly. All right, so Anaya went with butterfly method. Anybody else go with butterfly method? Somewhere in the problem? Excellent. Okay, good. Taylor? Um, pull out the important words. Pull out important words or phrases. Excellent. Anything else besides butterfly method and breaking down and analyzing the problem? Deza? The FOIL method. All right, so we might use FOIL. These are all things that we've used before, okay? Today, the purpose of this launch was just to get us thinking about what it is that we've been doing since we've been in class throughout Topic 8 the past couple of classes, okay? What is it that we've been talking about? Can somebody refresh my memory? Adrian? Factoring polynomials. Factoring polynomials. And what's a polynomial? Tiana? Poly. Well, poly means more than one, right? More than one what? Term. More than one term, okay. So we've been factoring polynomials, meaning we've been looking at things that have more than one term. And what's the purpose of factoring? Charity? To find the two factors are binomials. Mm -hmm. So if we have a trinomial, we break it down into binomials, and those are the factors that when you foil them out or multiply them back together, you get the original, okay? Let's look at our objective today, okay? Today in your Algebra 1 column, it says we're going to factor perfect square trinomials and the differences of squares. These are two special polynomials that we're going to learn how to factor, okay? What do you all notice about the two um, sets of trinomials or polynomials that we're working with? One is called perfect squares. One is called the difference uh, of squares. What do we know about perfect squares? Deza? It's like the corner can be multiplied twice. OK, so some number multiplied times 2. So it's like the same number multiplied twice. Times itself, right? So the same number, multiplication, multiplication is your operation. right? And what's it mean to be a trinomial? Taylor. Three terms. So we're going to have a trinomial that's made of three terms, and assuming somewhere in that trinomial we're going to have what? All right, let me rephrase the question, okay? We have a trinomial, which means we have three terms, and if we're talking about perfect square trinomials, what do we think we're going to see in our trinomial somewhere? Talana? A perfect square, okay? Then we're going to jump into talking about differences of squares. This is another polynomial, several terms. What do we think it's going to look like, a difference of squares? Talana? Square, like two squares subtraction. What makes Talana say subtraction? She says two squares, and then she said subtracted. What makes her think that, Adrian? You said difference of squares. Yeah, difference of squares. So we're going to be able to recognize when it's appropriate to factor using these special types of polynomials. When we see these polynomials, we should think, ah, perfect square trinomial. I know how to do that. Or we should be able to walk away saying, ah, difference of squares. I know how to factor these things. Our essential question is, can algebraic expressions that appear different, OK, appear different, actually have the same value? Where have we seen that before in the past Three or four lessons. Anaya? Your last class. All right, what about last class? Where did we see two expressions that actually had the same value, but they looked kind of different? When they, they appeared different, but they had like the same value when it was like one. Not a value of one. All right, what specifically were we looking for that was one? 
Uh, don't remember. Anybody can help her out. What is she thinking? Let's follow Anaya's train of thought here. Tyler. I'm guessing that, I think she's talking about when we did the guidance last class, mm -hmm. and some of the binomials, they had like the same, like, X plus three mm -hmm. in it. So maybe that's what she's talking about, like okay. similarities. Yeah, definitely. Talana? Um, when, how the problem, a uh, polynomial, but we started doing it just with one as a coefficient, mm -hmm. and then we moved on to greater than one. Right. So we took polynomials that had one as coefficients or numbers greater than one, and we ended up breaking them down into factors either way, right? Regardless of what method we used, we've been pulling out greatest common factors, we've been doing butterflying, right? Okay. So we've been taking these polynomials and breaking them down. We're going to be doing the same thing today, okay? Nothing is changing today. We're still pulling apart polynomials, they're just special kinds of polynomials, so we need to learn a few tricks. The essential understanding is found on 423. It says that you can factor some trinomials by undoing the multiplication of binomials. So we've taken two binomials and multiplied them before. What does that look like? Two binomials and we multiply them together. Charity? The FOIL. You can use FOIL method. There's box method. Okay, so we talked about FOILing. First outside, inside, last, all with what operation? Multiplication. multiplication. And then the box method, which some people prefer, still multiplication. We're taking two binomials, multiplying them out to create this polynomial, right? Factoring is undoing all of that. We're taking the polynomial and we're breaking it down into the two, the two, the two binomials that you would have multiplied together to get the original in the first place, okay? I use artifacts in my lesson by encouraging the students to be resourceful. So anything that's in the classroom that we've already used or looked at or referenced before is fair game. So several times my students have looked at my resource corner or the resource wall and been like, oh, I need to use this for this equation or this perfect square. And especially when you're working towards the end of a unit, say topic eight, it's nice to have artifacts from previous lessons in topic eight that the students don't have to flip back through the textbook or back through their journals to be able to reference. So you can factor some trinomials by undoing the multiplication of binomials. Who can help me fill this out? Remember that binomials multiplied or foiled out turn into what? A polynomial, more specifically a trinomial. All right, Taylor, will you go write that in for me? Do polynomial. And then polynomials factored, that idea of undoing, what do we revert back to? Charity? Your binomials, okay? So will you go write that into the other blank for me? And that way everybody else knows that it needs to go in their journals. The essential understanding needs to be found underneath today's heading in your journal. Awesome. So grand scheme of things, nothing's really changing today, okay? I don't want anybody to be intimidated by our new math vocabulary. Nothing's changing. We're still factoring. We're just going to be factoring some special cases, okay? The special cases that we're going to talk about are perfect square trinomials. How do we know that we're dealing with perfect square trinomials? And difference of squares, okay? That's what we're going to be working on. The first part that we're going to talk about is perfect square trinomials. Um, Talana already mentioned that we were going to have perfect squares. Can anybody help me remember what my perfect squares look like? Deza said some number multiplied times itself. Adrian? Four times four. So four times four, what would be the perfect square? The product? Sixteen. Sixteen. So sixteen is a perfect square. Excellent. Everybody good here? Because it just went out. Okay. Um, what else besides sixteen, Adrian? Let me get, let me get another volunteer. Um, Anaya? Eight times eight. eight times eight, which creates? 64. 64. So when we are looking at perfect square trinomials, what kind of numbers do you think we're looking for? Perfect. Perfect squares. So if we go down our list of perfect squares, we're going to be looking for four and nine, 16, 25. All righty. Everybody track the board up here. Perfect square trinomials. This looks awfully intimidating. But it's really not that scary. The polynomial is what we start with. It's equivalent to two binomials that are squared when you multiply them together. So everybody in their journal needs to have the parent formula down, and we'll do a practice problem with it, okay? 
I cue my students with the phrase tracking the board just because it's always important for me to get everybody's eyes up front, especially if the instructional delivery is happening on the whiteboard or something projected from um, Pearson or something has been written by another student. Sometimes I will have students track the speaker. So if a student is in a seat, then they would track the speaker to the seat. But most of the time I have my student presenters up front and it's my way to get everybody's eyes off the paper or whatever they're currently working on up to the front of the room. All right, guys, what do y'all notice? Turn and talk to your neighbor real quick. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. What do you notice about the parent formula? A, like when you do A plus B two times, that's how you get the um, exponent of two. And then when you just find the two numbers, you just plug it in and that's how it'll equal each other. All right, we're done. 20 seconds is up. Bring it back down to zero and five, four, three, two, one. How do we recognize a perfect square trinomial when we see one? What do we notice about our A and our B terms here? Tracking the board, this problem says digital images are composed of thousands of tiny pixels rendered as squares shown below. Suppose the area of a pixel is 4x squared plus 20x plus 25. What is the length of one side of the pixel? In what format, what form are they giving us the area in? In a trinomial. Excellent. So the area they gave to us is a trinomial. What do we notice about this trinomial? Adrian, is that a hand? Wait, come on. All right, Taylor, what do you notice about the trinomial? Only the um, a term is squared and x squared term. So the a could be a squared term because the x is squared? Mm -hmm. What else was supposed to be squared in a perfect square trinomial? The, um, the, b, the b term, the, that last constant, right? What do we notice about the constant here? It's a perfect square. It's a perfect square. So if I needed to break it down, five times five. All right, so how do I know that I'm supposed to be factoring here? How do I know I'm supposed to be factoring? They gave me the area, and I'm trying to find the length of one side. Yeah. Solana? Yeah. How do I know I'm supposed to be factoring? Why am I not doing something else with this polynomial? Because you have to find the length of one side, so you have to multiply it. Okay, I think I'm following you. Let me restate and let me make sure that I'm following you the right way. You're telling me that because I'm trying to find one side, I need one side times the other side to find the area they already gave me. And factoring will give me the two factors. So if I wanted to rewrite my polynomial 4x squared plus 20x plus 25, what could I rewrite 4x squared as? Deza? You can write it as... Um 2x mm -hmm. times 2x. 2x times 2x, which is the same thing as? 4x squared. Or 2x raised to the? Second power. Second power, right? I'm squaring what's already in my parentheses. What else could I rewrite here if I wanted to undo my squaring, per se? Tiana? The 25 to be 5 times 5. So it's the same thing as 5 raised to what power? To the, to the second power. So which one's my A and which one's my B? A is 2x. Adrian? A is the 2x. Uh-huh. And B is the 5 squared. Yeah, and B is the 5. Okay. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind the A is and the B are being squared. So you don't want to include the 2. That's really bad. We don't want to include the 2, okay? So when I go to rewrite this, if I want it to look like my parent formula, what's my parent formula again? A. A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. Right? It, at the end of the day, turns into, what, are, what ultimately does it turn into? A, A, A plus B. A plus B times A plus B, which is A plus B squared. squared. So all I really need to do is replace my A's with what? With 2x and my b's, With five. Anaya. I have a question. Why is the 5 squared b? I thought it was supposed to be c. Yeah. Okay, where is she going with that? That's absolutely right. 
Talana. Thinking of the equation of that, and we doing we using we using the um square, so it's a different equation. Okay. I think I follow Talana. Anybody else want to chime in? Following Anaya or Talana, Tayana. I think that's what we're doing like this because if we're squaring it, we only use the things that is perfect squares. We don't use like it wouldn't be C like it would because it's a perfect square. Right. So we're dealing specifically, Anaya, with what we call perfect square trinomials. So instead of it looking like this, where you label your coefficients A, B, and C, we're going to call them A and B only because we have perfect squares. So instead of putting it in this format where we label A, B, and C do butterfly method, we are only worried about finding A and B. What? How many variables do you see in my parent formula? Just A and B. Do I need my C constant? No. no, okay. So the constant, which would be my C here, is actually going to be written as B squared. Okay? So at the end of the day, 2x is my A, and B was what? 5. five. How can I be sure that 2x plus 5 squared turns into this? Do they have the same value? Can they be algebraic expressions that look different but have different that have the same values? Yeah. All right, so I want y'all to prove that to me, okay? Turn and talk with your neighbor real quick. Let's go like three minutes. So more importantly, we need to make sure it's, it's doubled, multiple of two. Two coefficient in the front. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Jason? Okay, question. Okay, you have the okay equation like that, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you have to go through the whole process to find the same answer again? Why would we do that? Was that the answer to my question? Is going from this back to this the answer to my question? No. No, that was just to what? It's to check the answer. What's the actual answer to the question? How do I know what one side length of the pixel is? Yeah, one side length is 2x plus 5, mm -hmm. right? And then the other side length is 2x plus 5. And that should give me the area of my square is equal to the 4x squared plus 20x plus 25. If you did box method over here, it would look like that, correct? So the answer to the question is the binomial portion, okay? Not the final answer. We worked backwards. Yes, ma'am. 524, there are three got it. You're going to have seven minutes to do the three got it. That's it, okay? So level one to two with a neighbor. I use champs for just about any time I need the students to be working independently or moving. Anything that might cause distraction or chaos, I have to lay those expectations first. So anytime we're kind of transitioning into from teacher led to group work or from group work into a new activity, I usually champ it out. It doesn't take any more than two seconds. Sometimes I'll have a student champ it out for me. Hey, I'm going to go start a station over here. Can you champ out what these girls are supposed to be doing for me? And the students have really embraced the fact that our champs is interactive. So they like to come up and they need to write on the board. And they're bought into the expectation for what they're supposed to be doing. How do you know that you're dealing with a perfect square trinomial there? Three times three equals nine. So three times three equals nine. What do you do about the front, the first coefficient? One times one is still like a perfect square because okay. it's multiplied so, by each other. Okay, so the implied coefficient is one, nine. and if you have one x squared, what things did you multiply together? The one x and one x. Yeah, just an x and an x, right? Excellent. So Good job. It will be x mm -hmm. squared? No, just x. The a would just be x itself, right? And then and you square it on the outside. Then when so you you, could, okay, then you can. So you can put you, one. So when you combine it, it will be x plus three squared. Now foil that out and make sure that that's true. Otherwise, okay. before you do that, before we, we do that actually, is this a multiple of two? Mm -hmm. Is it two times your A times your B? Yeah. Okay? Yes. Okay, so now it's actually worth your time to go back and check and make sure that that, work, that works. Good. First of all, do we have a perfect square trinomial? Mm, no. What makes you think that? Because nine, like, no. Wait, yeah. Okay, what makes you think yeah? Because six is, like, even. All right, does it have to be even? No. Well, it needs to be a multiple of two, right? Mm -hmm. We were talking about it. That was a nice question earlier. More importantly, we need to look at it. Is it a multiple of two? I know you like the butterfly method. Mm -hmm. Are we allowed to use the butterfly method to solve this? No. 
But we are. You can. But this, we don't. Okay, let me, let me clarify. What we're doing today is just a special case. So it doesn't mean you have to forget all the stuff we've already learned about. You can use all of the things you know about factoring to solve this problem. The easy way to do it is to recognize ah, it's a perfect square trinomial. The square root of 9 is 3. And the square root of x squared? 2. Not 2. What do you multiply by itself to get x squared? 1. 1 what? 8 squared. Just 1x. So if I have 1x squared to make x squared and 3 squared to make 9, then my answer should be the x and the 3. Oh. Does that make sense? You I think I'm getting kind of caught up with the This doesn't come until you combine your like terms. So my suggestion would be either use the cheat sheet, what we, which we took in your notes, where you put the a plus the b, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you don't want to do that, just do the butterfly method and see if you still get x plus 3 and x plus 3. Just double check. Okay? Yes. So rewrite it as something squared. What are you squaring? B, that's so good. All right, let's bring it in, guys. 5, 4. To the board. Let's talk about the other type of polynomial we're going to make um, special notes about today. We just talked about perfect square trinomials. What's coming next, guys? The difference of squares, okay? So we had talked about what operation should we recognize in difference? Subtraction. We should recognize subtraction. And what else should we notice? Some squares somewhere, right? Some differences between squares. What I would like y'all to do is write down this parent formula for difference of squares. A squared minus B squared is equal to A plus B times A minus B. And then we're going to work a model problem using this parent formula. Cornelia, what do you notice about this? The A term is squared. And Hannah, if I wanted to pick an A that I could square to turn it into the A term that Cornelia is talking about, what could I pick? 4. 4, right? 4 what? 4x. Four Right? Because 4x times 4x would give us the 16x squared. Mm -hmm. So this is actually just 4x squared. Katie? What about my 81? 9. 9 squared? So it's really just the result of 9. Ooh, not 8. Not 8. 9 squared. And then the operation, Brianna? Subtraction. Okay. What am I supposed to do? with the A and the B once I've identified it. Kira? What am I supposed to do with the A and B? Once I found out that A is my 4X and my B is 9, what am I supposed to do with those in order to factor? Combine them into the um, parentheses, into one parentheses, right? All right, so a set of parentheses. Kira says I should turn them into one set of parentheses. Yeah. How many of you agree with her? Two sets. Two sets of parentheses. That's different than the one we just did, right? Different than perfect square trinomials. What's going to go in each set of parentheses, Tiana? 4x minus 9 and then 4x minus 9. No, plus 9. Plus. Plus How many of you say minus 9? Because there's a minus here, right? I'm following her. You squared it, so you don't have to do it twice. Charity? Um, one would have to be plus because uh, a negative times a positive would equal the negative 81. Mm -hmm. So, but if you do two negatives, it won't e it'll equal a positive 81. Exactly. And how do you think we're going to get rid of that middle term? If I FOIL out the squaring that we did before, if it looked like this, when I FOIL out, I'm going to have a middle term. But if I do opposite signs like this and I FOIL out, I want to see if y'all can eliminate the middle term doing that, okay? Yeah. So let's take like one more minute. Foil that for me. Foil it out. I use a timer in my classroom mostly for myself, honestly, because I tend to talk a lot and I tend to go on tangents and I want to answer every single question. And I know the pacing is so important to be able to release the kids to have a chance to struggle through the material on their own. So it's more for me, more for pacing. The kids like the visual, so sometimes I use the one that projects onto the screen so they know exactly what kind of time limit they're working in, but it also creates a sense of urgency in the classroom, which I really appreciate. Two, one. All right, 
I need everybody's eyes up here. Charity's going to model her thinking for us just to see if we're on the same page, okay? So Charity, use your math vocabulary and tell us how you thought through this. I told you to FOIL because that was my hint. You did the rest. Okay. So since it's squared, you will multiply each turn twice. So 4x minus 9 and 4x plus 9. And when you distribute 4x to the 4x, you get 16x squared. And then when you multiply 4x times um, positive, um, now you get positive 36x. And then when you do negative times positive 4x, you get a negative 36x. And then when you do a negative 9 plus a negative times a ne positive 9, you get negative 81. And a negative 36x plus a 36x, you get 0 because it cancels out. And then you left with 16x squared minus 81. Good job. Thank you, love. Talana, can you ask your question again? Because I want everybody to hear it. When you're canceling out with these x terms, when you do the multiplication first, outside, inside, last, does, depending on whether this was positive or this was negative, it's going to affect your order. Does it matter if this had said plus 36 and this had said negative 36? Either x term, when you combine them, you will end up back at zero, whether you start with the positive and subtract or start with the negative and add, right? We're going to get a chance, a chance to practice all of this stuff today when, when, when we are in our groups. And I've already split you up based on what I know you need, okay? So here's what I need. Before we split up, I would like for um, Charity and Talana and Tayana and Deza and Taylor and Hannah. We're going to end up moving over here first. Everybody else, your instructions are going to be on the board. And then you'll get your turn with me, okay? I group the students differently every day. It just depends on the topic and the data that I have leading up to um, that lesson and the decision needing to be made. A lot of things that I have to consider are student absences and the pacing. If I know that the lesson that I'm working in is particularly challenging and particularly in depth, there's gonna be a certain group of students that I target to work together where we can move quickly and then there's gonna be a group of students that need their hand held and who need a little bit more instruction and a little more guided instruction. So they're the kids that I group together. So on top of whether or not the student has been present recently, whether or not they've been passing the other lesson checks, observational data. If a kid is lost in the middle of the lesson and I had them in one group, I can adjust those groups as they go. So. For example, today, Brianna hasn't been here in a while. She was like a deer in headlights. So today, I moved her into a group where she normally wouldn't have sat so that I could work with her in a group that was also struggling. And let's go like one minute to get situated in your new spot. So if I called your name, move over here. Everybody else, I'm going to put your instructions on the board. Will you erase my board for me? Go ahead. Let's get this started, guys. All right. Everybody have everything they need? All right. The reason I pulled y'all over here is because we are going to jump right into 8-8. Eight, eight. We did 8-7 with the special cases. We did 8-7 um, special cases already today, but we're going to jump into 8-8, eight, eight, which is factoring by grouping. I need your eyes because this is so important. Any time that your job is to factor a trinomial or a polynomial, you have the freedom to do it however you want. If you want to use box method, butterfly method, any way you want to do it, that's okay with me as long as we get the right answer, right? We're, we're shooting to be able to do it on the EOC. That's totally cool. But today, I wanted to expose you to another way to do it just in case, okay? Do you have to do it this way? Absolutely not. But factoring by grouping comes in really handy when you have really long polynomials that are more than trinomials. So how many terms are we talking about if we're talking about more than trinomials? Polynomials with what? Four, four terms. Four or more. Four or more terms, okay? So if you would, turn with me in your books to page 88, please. Or not 88, lesson 88 on 529. We're going to factor by grouping when the essential understanding says some polynomials have a degree greater than two. Remember what degrees were we did at the very beginning of eight? What were degrees about? The exponent. So when we have exponents that are like, oh, we're getting into something raised to the third, fourth power, then we're going to talk about, okay, well now in standard form I've got something to the fourth, to the third, squared, 
just the coefficient with x and the constant, that's a lot. And that looks intimidating to factor, but there's a hint, and it's about grouping. Um, what is a grouping symbol in math? Um, parentheses. parentheses, right? Parentheses is one way to group the things. Where else have we been factoring already, and have we used parentheses or grouping symbols to decide what we're going to factor? We do the binomial, mm -hmm. and we get the two parentheses, mm -hmm. and when you multiply together and fall and distribute. Excellent. So the parentheses are definitely our indicators that we're going to group things together, okay? Also, one of the things that I wanted to point out is, remember when we butterfly, um, did the butterfly method, and we got the two um, binomials based on what we pulled out of the greatest common factor? Do y'all remember that? Yeah, we plugged, we plugged them in for one of the um, terms. Okay, so the things that were in common in the parentheses became one of the binomials. And the other binomial came from those coefficients that we pulled out, remember? And how did we decide what to pull out? The two factors. The two and what? The add and um, multiply. The two greatest common The greatest common factors, right? And that's when you're looking at the exponents, that's where the adding and the multiplying comes in. So what I would like us to do is look at 529, okay? The essential understanding says that some polynomials with a degree... So look at this cubic polynomial. They give us 3n cubed minus 12n squared plus 2n minus 8. Do we know how to factor this yes. using the methods that I've taught you so far? Yes. Um, yes. We can use what we've learned if we use it creatively. If I want to group things here to factor... What should I use? Yes, ma'am? The 3n cubed minus, minus the ne uh, negative 12n squared, and mm -hmm. you can group them, too, because they got uh, greatest common multiple. What am I going to use to group them? What do we mean group them? Parentheses. So if I can identify things that have, I don't want to say like terms, but have common. factors in common that we know we can pull out, then this is actually really easy, OK? I need to be sure that if I group these, can I also group these? Yes. I can? Yes. I can group these too? Yes. My lesser degrees and my constants? Yes. If I treat them like two separate expressions and I want to pull out the greatest common factor in each, can y'all go ahead and tell me what, what common factors I should pull out? Three and two. Three here and two here? Is it just a three? Three in. Three in? Three in. Square. square. Why three and square, Taylor? Because... When you got 3n squared, you have another n inside the parentheses, and when you distribute, then you get 3n squared. Okay, so she says 3n squared. These both have 3n squared in common. Are we in agreement? Yes. Right, what do these both have in common? Two. Just the two. Why can't I do 2n? Because the constant don't got a... Um, you agree, Hannah? Yeah. There's no constant here. There's nothing. The constant doesn't have a variable. It's not a coefficient. I can't pull it out. So I've got these two things coming out as my... GCFs are my greatest common factors. What number 10? Number 9. Number 9. We're doing number 10 right now. Number 10, then. So, you know, you put to find the, the squares for A and B. So for V, V squared, you know that's automatically going to be a 1. Because anything squared to the second power and it don't have a number by the variable yeah, U. Yeah. It's an imaginary first, one. So and then for the B, 25, then the 5 times 5 is, is 25, so 5 squared. And then you plug both of them into a parentheses twice. Wait, do you turn it into, like, instead of keeping it 25, do you turn it into 5 squared? Yeah. Or do you just keep it 25? You turn it into 5 squared. I need everybody to listen very quickly and quietly so that we can make this rotation very seamless. If you were with me, you were going to come find a partner pair and a group to work in on the stuff they were working on. If you were working independently before, you're going to get your turn with me over here. So I need everybody to take their belongings to their new seats very quickly, like 57 seconds. I'm going to put the practice problems up here for you all to practice with. Do you have to get them all done? No, but I do want y'all to work together collaboratively, following your champs, expectations for the next 10 to 15 minutes while I work with the other girls, okay? And remember, you're just practicing what you learned today. Nothing new. All right.
the stuff's on the board for you guys. All right, my friends. We've been doing a lot, yeah? All right, I want everybody's eyes because I've told the other group this and I want to make sure that we understand. We are going to look at one practice problem from 8-8 today. There's an essential understanding there that I need us to believe, okay? It says some polynomials with a degree greater than 2 can still be factored, okay? Do y'all believe that we can see a long problem with a degree bigger than 2 and it can still be factorable? Yes. yes. Remember, the essential question is to take something that might be long or look funny and make, it smaller. make it smaller, but it has the same value. We're not changing it in any values here. We're just manipulating them to make them workable. Everybody following so far? Mm -hmm. Same thing as like combining like terms, simplifying expressions. Just make them look prettier so we like working with them. What's it mean a degree greater than two? Y'all remember degrees at the very beginning? Like eight one. Kira's checking her journal for me. Yep, we were talking about the naming binomial two, trinomial three. What were degrees? (laughs) What were degrees? Uh, like. A degree. It said the degree of a polynomial in one variable is the same as the degree of the monomial with the greatest exponent. So isn't it like a exponent? It's the exponents, right? So when we have something squared in our trinomial, that's usually the first term. Right? Yeah. And then the one with no variable, just the constants all the way at the end, the last term. Yeah. Remember, in standard form, there's a particular order they had to go in. If I had a degree or an exponent of 5, does that go on the far left or on the far right? Far right. On the far left, and my constants still are on the right. There should be an order. Left to right should be the biggest degrees or exponents all the way down to the tail with no exponents, right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at a cubic polynomial, problem 1 on 529. A cubic polynomial, that means there's how many terms? Three. 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 Four. Four terms. Look at polynomial, how many terms are in this problem? Four, but what's the greatest exponent we see? Twelve. Three. Three. And what's the exponent of 3 mean? Not squared, but cubed. 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 So we're cubing, right? That's the highest degree, and it's a polynomial, and it's not a trinomial anymore. It suddenly has how many terms? Wait, question. Four. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am? Why is it not, why is it 3 if it's cubic? If it's okay. a cubic problem. So the word cubic, is that the number of terms that we're worried about? No. If there were three terms, what would it be called, Adrian? A trinomial. trinomial. The cubic refers to what? Um, The exponent. That exponent, the highest degree, right? The highest degree of the polynomial when we write it in standard form. Would I ever switch this so that it says negative 12n squared plus 3n cubed? No. Not usually. Not if I'm going to write things in standard form, right? So let's look at this problem. I want everybody to write the problem 3n cubed minus 12n squared plus 2n minus 8 in their journals. No, no new heading. None of that. Just right where you were doing your practice problem. Let's just throw it in there, okay? When you multiply, yeah. when you fall out, you'll get 9m plus 9m, which equals 18m. Times. When, no, I'm talking about when you, when you fall out and you combine like terms. Yeah, and then you'll get the original problem. Okay, so summarizing, summarizing this small group right here, guys. This is useful when you have like the long polynomials with a bunch of degrees, okay? That's when you would use grouping. Do you have to group every time you see a polynomial on the board? No. Do you have to use butterfly method every time you see it? No. Do you have to use our perfect square trinomial shortcut? No, we don't have to use any of that. Those are just special tricks that you can use if you can recognize, hey, this is the kind of polynomial I'm working with. If you see one that goes all the way up to like six degrees, you should probably use this grouping, okay? Because it's gonna be hard to factor any other way. But you don't have to. I wanna make that very clear. I didn't put, I didn't give this to you to confuse you. I gave it to you to give you another option, especially when you have the long ones. What? We don't, you, can you do ABC with this one? No, no, because there would be a, 
a D, right? Like yeah. this would be A, this would be B, C, D. Exactly. So the A, B, C is in trinomials. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's curly. Except for if you want to put it in standard form, this one would go here, and this one would go here. Because it's squared. But it's squared. So it's, an, it's only about the exponent. So the exponent, 2, would move it behind the 3. All right, let's bring it in, guys. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Who can tell me, stay in where you are, everybody's eyes are up here, okay? Who can tell me what we did today? What kind of polynomials did we learn about? How, how do we know how to recognize them? What are, what are we doing here? What are we doing? Solana. We are finding the two binomials that multiply together to give us our trinomial. Our trinomial. That's what we've been doing this whole unit, right? Specifically today, we learned two types of polynomials that you might see, and light bulbs can go off in your head, hey, I don't have to do butterfly method. I don't have to factor it the way that I always factor it. There's a shortcut. What are those trinomials or polynomials called, and how can I recognize them? What, did, what, what are they called? Tayana? When we factor in perfect trinomials, and then we factor the different difference of the binomials. All right, so, well, we, binomials, all right, so we did a difference in squares and um, perfect square trinomials. How do we know that we have those going on? What should we look for? When do the light bulbs go off that say, hey, I have options for factoring here? Adrian? Mm -hmm. Find the perfect squares in the problem. When the polynomial has perfect squares in it, especially that A and B term, mm -hmm. what about difference of squares? How do we know that we have a difference of squares? Cornelia? Where you see a, a positive term and negative term. All right, so if you have them expanded out and you have the positive and negative, you know that that middle term is going to go away after you FOIL out. Mm -hmm. So that positive and negative, both in the parentheses, will give you no middle term, that difference of squares. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions about the big picture, what we've been doing? Factoring. Options for factoring? A lot. Yes, ma'am. Will this ever appear if you, um, you know when you do the perfect square, uh -huh. and you know how sometimes a decimal and two, another decimal times it by each other, you get a whole number? Mm -hmm. Can you do that with this? Yeah, you sh the, ultimately you should be able to take, as long as it, if it's a square, you should be able to find what decimal times itself gives you the new number. But if it's not a perfect square, there might not be a decimal that times itself gives you that number. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. First, you want to recognize, is it a perfect square? If it is, then you can find that decimal. If not, don't worry about it. Did I answer your question? I feel like I might not have. Big picture, guys, what we've been doing this entire unit is factoring. We gave you options for factoring, right? And now, today, we might have learned about these special cases. They're not meant to confuse you. They're meant to give you options. Hey, if I recognize that it's a difference of squares, all I need to do is rewrite my A and B terms, right? Or if I can tell that it's a perfect square trinomial and that middle term is 2 times my AB, I recognize it's a perfect square trinomial. I can factor it differently than the way that I factored in 8.5, okay, or 8.4. Is everybody following there? This is only to give you options. On the EOC, do you think you'll ever get a problem that says, factor this polynomial? No. On the EOC, it's likely to be in the context of problem solving. So we need to be able to recognize when is it appropriate to factor, and when it's time to factor, what methods can I use? And I want you to have all of these methods in your toolbox so you know exactly what you're supposed to be pulling out of the toolbox to answer the questions, okay? Right now, you're gonna have a chance to show me what you know. I know I usually ask you to do them on a separate sheet of paper, but today, I want this to be in your journal, so when I check journals, I can just check it straight out of your journal, okay? This is your lesson check. These are problems from 8-7 and 8-8. So in the lesson check in the textbook, I went through and I picked out the problems that mirror what we did today. These two, hint, hint, are from 8-7. This one is from 8-8. What I would like for you to do is close your textbook. Leave your journal open because you're going to write with your journal. And what I would like for you to do, 
for the first, I don't know, two minutes of this, I want you at a level zero, okay? Level zero, if you need help, what's a resource that's available to you at a level zero? Talana? Your notes in your journal, right? The activity is gonna be these three problems from the lesson check. There shouldn't be any getting up and moving around and you are putting pen to paper or you're brainstorming how you're gonna solve the problem, okay? We're gonna go two minutes of independent work on these three problems. Any questions before we get started? Two minutes independently, right? Ready? Go. I used the lesson check to close the lesson as um, a check for understanding that's more formal. Most of the time I'll have students do it independently first so I can gauge where the students are at without referencing the textbook and their partners and all of the other resources that are usually available to them during the lesson. Um, today's lesson, I combined questions from the lesson check, so instead of them having do, to do the entire lesson check, all eight questions from either side, I picked the questions that most mirrored what we accomplished in class so that the students were positioned as competent to answer what they were supposed to answer for the day. Um, and usually I collect it as an exit ticket, but sometimes I'll just use it as a springboard to facilitate a group discussion. Today's lesson was the end of a unit, so I also wanted to have a whole group discussion about the end of the unit. What is it that we've accomplished in chapter eight and where are we gonna use it going forward? Um, just as like a summary. Eyes on me. Y'all did a bunch of brainstorming. I'm gonna let you have two more minutes to collaborate, okay? Two minutes with a neighbor. If you want to keep working independently, that's totally fine too. Two minutes to collaborate. Yeah. Solana, will you come do the first one for me? Yeah. That's okay. Do you have to do the stuff from this lesson to be able to factor that? You can do butterfly and do nine times four. And put 12 in the bottom. So, but there's no C term, right? This is your C term. Okay, oh, it's, okay. Say, okay, but in the one we did to, in the one we did today, we didn't identify A, B, and C. But this is still a trinomial where you can identify A, B, and C if you would rather go that route. Okay, so, it's so like I know Cornelia. Where's Cornelia? I know for the first one you're butterflying, aren't you? Yes. Okay. So we'll, totally okay. We'll I'm gonna have to do the um, you know when we. Let's see. Have to do the four and stuff again mm -hmm. at the end because it got the. Instead of having a one, it have a nine. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's going to be like the the second time we talked about butterfly, where it takes that extra step. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I got this. I How'd you get all sixes? Because three times three is nine, and two times two is four. So you broke them down. Yes. And, and then where'd you put your twos? Right there. Okay. Go back and check your notes from today. Are they up here? Yes. How can you rewrite it? If your A you got was three and your B you got was two, how can you rewrite it? Three times two, three times two. Right, so do that and then foil it out and see if you get the original polynomial. If you don't, then we gotta pick different numbers or we gotta put a variable in there somewhere. What did you recognize about the expression? Just immediate thoughts like, oh shoot, I have to do this lesson check. What do we know? Adrian? <laughs> You did it, so you get to explain it. I noticed that it could be done with the um, butterfly method mm -hmm. and that it, yeah. If you had to categorize it, Adrian, into something we did today and like use the vocab for like today's objective, which category does this fall in? The perfect square. The perfect square. Tri trinomial. trinomial, excellent. So I know Cornelia opted to do it, and Tyler also opted to factor this the way they know how to factor trinomials, okay? They factored this way, identifying an A, B, and C, completely okay. They're gonna get the same answer as our friends who did the shortcut. So Talana, how did you know that 9P could be rewritten with a 3P instead? And when you do 3P times 3P, you'll get it raised 9P raised to the 2 right? squared. How did you know that 4 could be written as 2 squared? Because when you do two, ti 2 times 2 is 4, which is 2 squared. All right? Yes, Tyler. I have a question though. So instead of, so like, not, see how I say 9P2? 
Uh-huh. And then she dropped she dropped down and she did three P two. Mm-hmm. So the two just carried over, like you don't have to say like that would be nine P squared, like cause that be confusing me sometimes. Okay, so I, if I'm hearing you correctly, having the parentheses here makes a world of difference, okay? Otherwise, it would say, how is 9p squared the same thing as 3p squared? Yeah. They're not the same thing. But 9p squared is the same thing as 3p In parentheses. squared. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, you take the square root of the coefficient and then the square root of p squared, which is just p. Okay. Okay, excellent point. So beyond all of this, Talana, you found your A and B terms and rewrote them. How did you know that it was a perfect square trinomial based on your middle term? Because when you did, when you did the four method and you came down to 6P, 6P, when you add the two like terms, you end up with 12P. Good. And this being a multiple of two, it's the same thing as two times your A times your B, right? So you do A times B and you get 3P times two, which is 6P. Then you multiply that by 2, double it, you get your 12p. And when she foiled them out, she actually got 3p plus 2, 3p plus 2, the same thing. Um, Cornelia, was it you who pointed out the two different signs? Yes. We would have different signs doing this expression, but because we're doing this one, perfect square trinomial, they're the same sign, I can rewrite it, Taylor, as one binomial times another binomial, but if the binomials are the same, then you square it. Then you just square it. Excellent. Y'all did excellent today. We're going to touch on this some more. We're going to have plenty of chances to practice factoring. Do not panic.